Tonight, we are gonna be answering the question, can a little $500 camera lens beat the James Webb Space Telescope? A billion, more than a billion, I don't know how much it costs. Really expensive space observatory out in the deep dark depths of space at Lagrange Point 2. Can this little guy do something that the James Webb cannot? And you may be surprised to find out the answer, which foreshadowing, Yes, yes it can. It definitely can do things James Webb cannot. But let me walk you through uh, the equipment set up here, tell you about why I'm using this tiny little camera lens to take photos of space, as opposed to a giant sized telescope. So working from the bottom up, uh, there is no way to do long exposure astrophotography without, without accounting for the rotation of the Earth. And that's what this little guy is for. This is an Ioptron HEM27. It's an equatorial mount that is going to counteract Earth's rotation and follow the night sky exactly where I want to look. That is absolutely critical. Next, of course, we have somewhere buried in all of these accessories, the Rockinon 135 camera lens. There you can see the front of it. Now this is a quote-unquote portrait lens. It's a Manual focus, manual aperture, just an old school style portrait lens that has become famous in astrophotography for having superb optical quality. And I can in fact confirm this as the proud owner of two Rockinon 135s. My second one is in Africa doing a serious business. This one is here at home. Anyways, this little camera lens with a short focal length of 135, which is really not that much zoom, is going to be what we're using to capture our views of space tonight. Apart from this, I have a bunch of accessories that basically make the whole thing functional. Uh, I have here a guide scope on top. Now this is going to uh, keep the motion of the stars as, they, as we track, nice and sharp. Super critical when you're uh, using a tracking mount such as this. And this little second camera and guide scope is going to follow a star make sure everything is going smooth. Now here I've also got an autofocuser and this turns my old manual lens into an autofocusing one that more importantly works with my capture computer back here, which is my new ZWO ASI Air. So all these things combined basically turn this portrait lens, this $500 camera lens into a beast for deep space astrophotography. This is a black and white camera that cools down the sensor so it's ultra cold, no noise. And then we have a filter wheel with a bunch of specialized gas filters that we will get into soon. So comparing this little tiny camera lens to the James Webb Space Telescope is kind of like comparing apples to oranges, but they are two instruments with the same goal in mind, which is observing space. Now these instruments are both designed to observe very different parts of space in different ways. The James Webb Space Telescope is a Korsh type reflector telescope with a diameter of 6.5 meters or 21 feet. It's got a focal length of 131.4 meters and a focal ratio of f20.2. All of this is to say that the James Webb Space Telescope is optimized for looking deep. It has big zoom, big focal length, and a very slow focal ratio relative to other kinds of optical instruments. And not only this, the James Webb is optimized to look at the orange to mid-infrared wavelengths instead of the visible wavelengths. This is because this telescope is really intended to look at super deep galaxies, things that are basically at the edge of the observable universe, and that is what James Webb excels at. If we were to compare those stats to this little camera lens, obviously the camera lens falls short at the goal that James Webb is designed for. My camera lens has a focal length of 135 millimeters, which is almost a thousand times less focal length than the James Webb. But on the other hand, the focal ratio is f2 of this camera lens as compared to f20 of James Webb, which is to say its optical speed is significantly greater. In order to understand part of what makes this difference so relevant, we have to look at the real size of nebula in the sky. Here's the moon, and for example, it is half a degree across. This is the Andromeda galaxy, and it's three degrees across in the sky. And what we're shooting tonight is SH2216, a planetary nebula about two degrees across, and one of the closest planetary nebula to Earth. This nebula is so big that James Webb would take so much time to be able to capture it in its entirety that it's basically impossible. And this is the advantage of the wide camera lens. 
All of the stars in our night sky, including the ones you can see behind me here, uh, that is Pleiades right there, that little cluster, they are all giant balls of fusing elements. Most commonly hydrogen and helium, but the elements that are fused within stars change as the star nears the end of its life and depending on what the mass of the star is. When a smaller uh, medium to low mass star goes throughout its life, what happens is it starts as a great big ball of hydrogen and it fuses that hydrogen together into helium at its core. The energy generated by this fusion pushes outward on that huge ball of material while gravity uh, pushes inward. And there is a delicate balance between the radiation pressure from the core and the gravity of the whole mass of gas and plasma pushing down and crushing everything in the, in the middle. Now over time, all of the hydrogen in the star is used up and it starts fusing helium into heavier elements and so on. And the energy generated by the fusion of these heavier elements actually outweighs the force of gravity. So the balance between the fusion force and the gravity is won by fusion. And thus the outer layers of the star begin to be kicked out. Uh, they're sent out into space, outward in every direction from the star, leaving behind a big bubble of gas. Now eventually that star will completely die. And all that's gonna be left is the core of the star in the middle. And this is a very hot, special type of star we call a white dwarf. It is incredibly dense, incredibly hot, full of ultraviolet radiation. And this radiation actually ionizes all the layers of the star that got thrown out earlier in the star's death cycle. Now this is how a planetary nebula is formed. And this is how this SH2 object was actually formed itself. The closer the thing is, the bigger it's going to be in the sky, and also the more time an explosion has had to go, the, the greater in size it's going to be. These two things combined together, the fact that this PN is quite ancient, while it's also one of the closest to the Earth, means that it, you know, combines to be the largest planetary nebula in our sky. Now these kinds of nebulas are composed of really specific gases that help us know for sure what's a PN and what's not. Typically it'll be things like helium emission, hydrogen emission, and oxygen emission. Now tonight what we're doing with our telescope, actually right now, is we're looking at those specific gas emission wavelengths so that we can view the nebula in its full contrast. Because yeah, these, these nebula are only visible, you know, in these specific wavelengths. So if we just use our camera to isolate these wavelengths, lengths of interest, we can see the nebula in way better contrast. And that's what we're doing tonight. I've got a hydrogen alpha filter to see the hydrogen emission of red, and I have an O3 to see the green emission. So we should be able to get a nice high contrast view of the gases that compose this nebula, and along with a little bit of RGB just for some star colors. But yeah, that's basically an explanation of how uh, PNs form. Uh, that's the abbreviation we call them. We call them PNs. And the abbreviation for a white dwarf, we call them a WD for white dwarf. And even more in a planetary nebula astronomy, we also like to call the white dwarf the CSPN, which stands for the Central Star Planetary Nebula, which is kind of the progenitor forming star of a PN. Those are, those are your fun facts for today. I'm uh, excited to see what we get for tonight. Well, last night was kind of a mess. Um, also, all literally all of my oxygen data uh, out of focus. <gasps> I think it's partially because of dew, uh, some dew on my time-lapse camera. So, you know, gonna have to rerun the rest of the oxygen data from home. You and me are gonna do a little shooting from our driveway tonight. And we're hopefully gonna recover that oxygen data we lost. Uh, this is most unfortunate because the O3 emission is the hardest to capture from light pollution. So I'm really gonna, you know, put this little system to its paces here as we try and shoot the, uh, the most difficult wavelengths. When it comes to the largest planetary nebula in our night sky and one of the closest ones to Earth, James Webb really can't feasibly take a photo of it in a reasonable amount of time. And that is why this little camera lens is much more efficient at this task than James Webb, simply because James Webb doesn't have the field of view to actually image objects like uh, the largest PN in the sky. We need something 
with uh, you know, a little bit less zoom to be able to see things. You can think of it exactly like, you know, if you go to Paris and you want to take a photo of the Eiffel Tower and you're standing right under it, you know, you're not going to want to bring the telephoto lens because taking a photo like that is going to be quite difficult. But if you bring your nice fisheye lens, everything is going to be visible and it will be very simple. And that is exactly what's going on here. This largest planetary nebula is like our Eiffel Tower. James Webb's the telephoto and this is the wide angle. And this will get it all in one easy shot. So we're gonna try and finish that up tonight. Hopefully get a nice image, both from a dark sky site and from home with the little camera lens telescope. One of the biggest complaints that I hear about astrophotography is that with all of these professional space observatories, why bother? What is the point? There already are these amazing images out there and we surely can't do any better ourselves. And my reason for making this video was to try and show that this is very far from the case. Real science can still be done by people like you and me with inexpensive telescopes and even cheap little camera lenses. So after two nights of imaging from home, I ended up producing a result that was pretty far beyond my expectations. Now this is SH2216, the largest planetary nebula in the night sky. I hope you all enjoyed the video and this final photograph.